Osiris. Count to three. Come with me, and you'll be in a world of... Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. You have found Daniel Donato's Lost Highway. That lost highway. Yes. Howdy, friends. Welcome to episode 56 of the Lost Highway podcast. This is the podcast of all things Cosmic Country. This is Daniel Donato, and I want to thank my friends and family over at Osiris Media for hosting the Lost Highway podcast and our friends over at Topo Chico for keeping us hydrated here um, as we move down this endless highway of space and time and the synchronicity of events that are tied in between each and every present moment that we are either present or not present for. Uh, two things that are happening here that I want to talk about today. The first thing is that Cosmic Country and Western Songs has been out uh, as of uh, October 7th for a week, uh, which is very fun. There's like these kind of odd ways that the music works in ways that you wouldn't expect in the ways that it paints other people's lives. People sending like videos of them at their, you know, working at, um, at grow, grow houses and listening to um, my take on like a Waylon Jennings song. And then there was someone who had uh, sad, song, sad songs and waltzes like playing at their wedding. And it was like... Music is an interesting life form that is a, a absolute privilege in, in a very humble um, dialect to uh, to say to collaborate with. So it's like very fun. Please go listen to the record and then also check out episode fifty five where I break down each and every song and every moment and then uh, fun things in between. Uh, second thing I want to talk about here is this uh, this idea because I've been thinking a lot lately about this one quote um, called uh, that was uh, from Lou Reed. Uh, that is, um, between thought and expression lies a lifetime. And it's like, whoa, right? Between thought and expression lies a lifetime. So just kind of think about this for a second. You have all these ideas, right? You have you have a, a song idea, or you'll have a, a creative idea, or you have an idea for a job, right? These might be goals, or they might be visions, which I believe are two separate things. Um, the expression of the thought... That is the thing. That is actually when you take this thing that comes from your internal world and you bring it into the external world. And that is where limitations are found. That is where sculpting is to be had. That is where it needs to, it, where it is interfacing no longer with a personal truth, but with an objective truth that is created by this world and all of the uh, forms of consciousness that inhabit it. And so that's a really interesting thing. So just kind of thinking about this here, between thought and expression lies a lifetime. I also think what this is, is, is good news because there is a, life is essentially a process. And so there is a process that is the entire duration of your conscious experience in which you are going to be attempting either in a humble way, an obtuse way, in naive, in naive ways, or in understood ways, and likely a spectrum between all of those, in which you're going to be testing and creating expression born from thought. I don't know where thoughts come from. And it seems like there's a lot of good ideas on where they do. I like Jordan Peterson's uh, talks on where do thoughts come from. I like where Joe Rogan's things call, ta uh, thoughts come from. I also like where Bob Weir says he thinks where he thinks thoughts come from, um, and he thinks thoughts and ideas are rather life forms that are um, asking of you in a rather egoless way for you to express themselves through the medium of a physical being. That is you. Very interesting, isn't it? So. Between thought and expression lies a lifetime. Keep having thoughts. Keep attending to your thoughts because they are, are perhaps these sources that are not from this space and time but are very much so real beings that deserve just as much respect, love, and cordial communication as would say uh, your parents or your friends or people that are within your cosmic circles, I like to call it, uh, which I keep a little bit tight. Um, Right? And so it's like you have all these thoughts, tend to them and express them in ways that are uniquely you. 
and then I'll leave you off with this one. Cause this, this, I remember this being like the first thing that inspired me and also confused me at the same time from a writer. Um, it's from Bukowski. Somebody asked me, what do you do? How do you write? How do you create? You don't, I told them. <laughs> you don't try. <laughs> That's very important not to try. Either for Cadillacs, or in my case, I, I wouldn't mind the Tesla. Uh, creation or immortality. You wait. And if nothing happens, you wait some more. It's like a bug high on the wall. You wait for it to come to you. When it gets close enough, you reach out, slap it, and kill it. Or if you like its looks, you make a pet out of it. I just love that. I really do just love that. Um, there it is. So uh, don't try and allow the process of a lifetime to take its course between your thoughts and your expressions. I want to talk a bit about Ida May, which is the band made up of Chris Turpin and Stephanie Jean Ward. Uh, specifically, I'm, I'm speaking with my friend Chris Turpin today. Um, this band, this duo, husband and wife, they are perhaps one of the most realized and effectively empathetic acts that I've ever had. Literally the ability to, to write with, but then also uh, to go and see. Um, Sometimes they have a full band with them, sometimes just the two of them. And they reach these volumes and these dynamics that are just like the full spectrum of what a human's emotions are. Angry, adventurous, open-minded, loving, loss of love. And all of their songs kind of cover all of these colors, if you will. It's a very effective musical rainbow, this group. Their harmonies are just like from not a space and time uh, place. Uh, the fact that they're married, the fact that they have this personal of a connection together, I think really bleeds through the music. Um, it's Americana, it's blues and rock, but more importantly, it's really just love in every beat, in every moment, in every word, and all the space between the words. And I think like that might be the most powerful raw energy resource that this universe produces in an, an abundant and ultimately benevolent way. Um, so why wouldn't you go and listen to Ida May after listening to what I'm going to say is the realized genius of Chris Turpin today on the Lost Highway podcast. Basically cut a whole album in a day. Um, but check out this fucking studio, man. Check this out. So wait, you cut a whole album in a day. Um, it's obviously not the new record that's coming out. So is it, what is it, just a live version yeah. of it that's coming out? Yeah, it's like a album release stream with a full band, which we've never really done. But check this studio out. It's fucking glass. It's it. <laughs> that's awesome. What are your thoughts on, on, um, on live streaming? Because you're a musician, you have played a lot of shows. So what are your thoughts on... Oh, shit, we've started. Sorry. Oh, I was getting oh no, you're good. I just like start. I like, I like going into it. Everyone who listens to this podcast, like I always get messages where it's like, I just love how y'all start. Y'all dive in. I think that's cool. You know, it's informal. It's like, great. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we were to be hanging in person, I wouldn't be like, okay, Chris, are you ready to start talking? <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true, yeah. What are your what are your thoughts on because I'm very interested to hear this. I have noticed that musicians that are very much so based in live performance and have always been the live stream thing doesn't equate in the same way. No, it doesn't. There just isn't the emotional payoff. I think you've got to consider it's all group dynamics, isn't it? Really, when you're in a space in a room with people uh, and there's a huge feedback loop happening all the time um, when you're playing yes. live. You know, and you, you know yourself from playing, you're always elevated by your audience and the crowd and the people around you. So right. without that, you know, yeah, it's like the communication is only one way. So it's been, we've actually enjoyed it in some ways, especially early on. I think when the world during the pandemic felt like it was completely crumbling around all of us. It really did. Early moments of, you know, Instagram live and that sort of thing were quite oh. important. It was kind of like, you know, holding hands digitally around the world, you know, or something yeah. like that. Quite <laughs> precious, you know. But after a while, the novelty does wear off, yeah. It really does wear off. It's weird how it, it's, it's just odd. It's weird how other things can be translated to live streaming, like, like video games, like doing Fortnite, things like that, Red Dead Redemption, you know, all these, yeah. all these yeah. Rob Roblox um you know but music it's very funny it's like music's very old music's like we've been doing music per, live performing music for how many uh generations now you know and it's weird how it doesn't necessarily translate over to the live stream situation 
I've done several, dude, and it's it's very odd. Either they're pre-recorded, and you're just kind of like playing to a room, like pretending that there's people there, or there actually is a live stream that's really happening, and then you're just like kind of very hyper focused on this, you know, two inch screen that's capturing the entirety of everything that's going on. When before your consciousness is really like, imagine you're on a stage, you're looking at the exit signs, right? You're noticing dust in the air. You're noticing the people on the back, you know, you're noticing some dude up front's wearing Crocs and you're like, well, I got to go buy some Crocs on Amazon now. (laughs) There's There's all kinds of variables that are capturing your attention that actually can like put you in nice places creatively. But when you're in the same room, for the whole show and there's no audience and you're just putting out all this energy. <laughs> you're like, you finish the song on a one, two, three, four. And then it's. Yeah. Oh, it's the next song. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. And if you think with um, music in general, I, you know, you, um, I'm sure music goes back much further than generations. I mean, in terms oh, yeah. of it, well, of course we know this, but in terms of, you know, music and ceremony, it's mm. like a big thing always, which always includes whatever, you know, religion or where you are in the world. They always go hand in hand and poetry as well mm. involved in all of that. So kind of, yeah, ma- making those kind of vibrations on your own is a little strange. So but that's what we try to do. We're currently filming this, um, right. the new record, this, this live thing, but uh, we had a film crew and we're all tested. So there was a group of people and it's the first time that we've come together and pl- made music with anyone in a year. So there was quite a lot of energy, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, a couple of things I want to talk about there, because that's really great. Um, God, there's just so much I want to talk about. I'm just such a big fan, man. I really am. I've oh, been- thank you, man. Well, vice versa. Yeah, me, yeah. me yours also. <laughs> it's really true, though, yeah. So, um, okay, I want to say vibrations for later, because I've been thinking a lot about vibrations lately and, like, what... I've been thinking a lot about like, what are words that we say that mean more than the words that we say? Right? Like tone? Like what is t- like tone? Like that's not just a word. That's not T-O-N-E. It's like, it's many words and meanings and adjectives and memories tied into one little stupid four letter thing. And like vibrations are kind of that as well. Um, but I want to hear about new record. I want to like, if for everyone who doesn't know who and what Ida May is, perhaps we can fill the listeners in on that. Um, you know, Marcus King's on your guys' new upcoming album. I would love to hear about how that's going on. So let's just start from there. Like the story of Ida May is one that is unbelievably heroic and ends with a positive love story. And I love when love stories end on a good note. <laughs> Recently in my life, we've not been. So it's good. I- the light at the end of the tunnel here. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of time for all that. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. Well, me and my my wife now, Steph, we were in a rock and roll band in the UK mm-hmm. uh, for years. We were like an underground rock and roll band, um, and then we kind of had had deals, and they fell apart, and da da da. And long story short, we ended up heading out to Nashville mm-hmm. um, with a with a new project called Ida May. Um, Where did that name come from? It's uh, it's the first song that me and Steph learned to sing. It's uh, it's an early kind of blues tune, a Lightning Hopkins tune, and uh, Sonny Terry. And it's the first song that me and Steph learned to sing together, so it felt very appropriate. And it's a, it's a name as well that um has Irish roots and German roots, and Steph is Irish, and you know, but it, but has still has the connotations of, you know, rock and roll and blues. So we just thought it was a relatively, it's an odd thing to call that a band. But we felt it kind of had this romantic connotation, so we kind of ran with it. Um, but long story short, we ended up doing our first record in this studio that we're currently in, mm. um, in the UK. Mm. Um, and we moved out to the US, to Nashville, for the last three years and mm. made this record and just hit the ground running. Long story short, we were on um, a couple of major labels and it didn't go particularly well there. We just kind of didn't want to make too many compromises and ended up making this very uh, uh, live record. Uh, Can I ask about what compromises? Like, I'm very interested in hearing because we're shifting to this place now in the music business where it's very direct to consumer, you know, D to C. Um, <clears throat> and so the need for a middle uh, infrastructure for certain artists is growing less and less prevalent. For other genres, absolutely, it's very needed, right? So you want to do something in pop or, or commercial country, things like that. But for what you guys do, like the ceiling inherently is large, like there's Black Keys level success. But like you guys really could just build it your own and just go through an independent distributor 
uh, something like one RPM, 30 Tigers. So can I ask about like what kind of, like in working with major labels, what was it that they were offering you? You were like, I don't know if that's really part of our business plan here. Uh, it's such a, uh, a big question uh, and conversation this. Uh, because you know I'm a little older than you, and we've we started very young in the music industry. Yeah. Um, so me, we kind of felt it's kind of like the hangovers of the last generation of record deals is what we were dealing with in the early stages of our oh, wow. careers. And I think, especially with major labels, there they do exist in a world where you know you sign for three to five albums, and there's an advance, and there's a payoff, and we keep fifty percent of this. And um, it was a very very old school model that they're operating on yeah i you know basically we, we became relatively convinced that that model didn't doesn't necessarily need to exist anymore in that oh. form and we wanted to move away from that so long we were on warners at the time and the subsidiary of warners that we were on was changing shifting from a more rock and roll label to a more of a hip-hop kind of focused um situation so we decided we had the opportunity to stay right. or to leave and we said, well, we're going to leave. And for exactly the reasons that you just kind of said, you know, we felt that there was a new business model that if we were able to make enough money on the road, that we didn't have to make sacrifices and give away copyright and ownership if we, if we didn't have to. Um, so that's what we've endeavored to do with this project. And we are working with 30 Tigers. And, uh, I, and I do agree that, yeah, you don't necessarily need a middleman, but it all depends on how you want to operate your business. Because I do think a kind of chimera of old school rock and roll and um, the aloof Dylan-esque artist, you know, who sits in their, in their room and, you know, writes music by candlelight and doesn't talk to anyone is, is what I think a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of artists would prefer is a world they're a lot more comfortable in because it's incredibly personal and private what we do. Um, but social media has kind of blown that open. And I think you're a, you're a fantastic example of someone who's, very able to communicate and open and honest and has, you know, some people I don't think have that side to their art, their artistry, you know, and their craft. So mm -hmm. I do agree that you can get direct to your fan much, much quicker, but mm -hmm. that, that isn't to say that social media isn't still moving those um, goalposts all the time, you know, with Instagram changing algorithms and that sort of thing. It's, it's a constantly shifting territory. So yeah. Yeah. I, I hear. It's, it's, I, I think less and less that Instagram is going to be the thing that really grows platforms. I think it's like if you already have a good one on there, then you have like solid retention. But it's like, yeah. man, I went from May, I went from um, May to August of last year without gaining more than a hundred followers, and I was posting several times a week, and it was very, very odd. It was like because I'm, you know, we go and look at the analytics, and it's like. The Instagram is like not showing this to people like on purpose. Like there's definitely something happening there. And it might not have been like, let's stop Daniel from being seen. And it might be more like, let's just show these 10 to 12 topics that are trending right now. And that's all we're really going to show people. And it's like, that's really not cool. So what that ships to is you have less algorithmic assistance and you're just going off what you already organically have. And if you're lucky, they'll show you to your full organic audience. Like not even a new algorithmic bash. And it's like, that's a little frightening. So like, you got to find other ways to communicate on different platforms. That's why I feel like TikTok and YouTube and podcasts too are like just so cool because you yeah. can blow on those. Like you can directly communicate to everyone you want and you can still have that algorithmic success. Oh, completely. No, I, well, I, I think everyone across the board felt that on Instagram when suddenly almost overnight, from reaching your fan base and talking to fans, you just weren't coming, weren't popping up anymore. And that was particularly frustrating for us because we'd been on these tours and we'd reached out, you know, uh, Ida May, you know, the independent music, you know, that, like we were making, isn't necessarily going to trend on hashtags and go up and da da da. So a lot of our fans, we were literally finding them, you know, after shows, we'd do a tour and people had tagged us at gigs. And so we've physically gone and, you know, made fans that now we can no longer reach. But anyway. That's another story. So yeah, finding ways like this is definitely a much more interesting way of, uh, of finding a fan base, really. Yeah. The, the new record is is so good, man. I mean, it is. What's, what's amazing, which I really admire, is you guys are able to do kind of the yin and yang. You can do the really intimate, unbelievably focused delivery 
of a song and like and um, quaint production. And then the next track over, like on the song um, Deep River with Marcus K. Yeah. 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 You're talking about the other side of the spectrum. And what what's so weird is everyone always tries to do other side of the spectrum moves, but the authenticity often uh, only stays on one side of the spectrum. <laughs> and then there's just like kind of like, well, I'll listen to this one like till they get over it. And then I'll, I'll zoom on to the next track. But you guys like legitimately are realized in both dynamics. Um, what's the deal with that? Like, how do you, I know it's hard to explain that, but like, how do you do that? Like, that's so... Um, different i think you put it you surmise that really perfectly I don't, I don't think a lot of people have noticed that about us um and it is strange it's also a fault as much as it's a, a positive because um any strength is though that's yeah. the, that's the definition of shadow the carl Jung concept is that everything we have and possesses has a shadow side and it's so true absolutely mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's a strange thing in music because so often you want to be categorized and, and put in a genre. That's what people like to do. And that's how, uh, especially for music magazines and that sort of thing. Um, right. it's, it's a blessing and a curse, but it's just what we've done. Cause me and Steph grew up playing in and out of London and playing in rock and roll bands and, but falling in love and being obsessed with, you know, Americana country songwriting and early country blues records. And, you know, from, you know, Lucinda Williams to BRMC, you know, this is kind mm -hmm. of what we loved in our wheelhouse. So um, we decided when we started Ida May that we wanted it to be incredibly pure and just like really, you know, whatever songs were coming out, just that's what we're going to track and we're going to record it live in just a few takes. And we've still really, really kind of adhered to that. We've, we've flirted with co-writing with um, some great co-writers and collaborators, um, you know, in the, kind of country and pop world, the rock world, British and US, but we've never really um, right. tried to concentrate our record or output around a certain sound. We've just, whatever has come up is, well, that's important right now. So that's what we're going to record and that's what's going to be on the record. So in terms of the two sides of it, I think it was just, um, we self-produced this album and we had a little bit more time. We did it at the beginning of the pandemic. It's not out yet. It's out in July. So we did it. Um, we played our last show in San Antonio, Texas at the end of this tour and came home. And we were going to fly people out from the UK to, do, to track some of it in Nashville. And that all went out the window. So we ended up blowing all of our money on recording equipment and just cutting it on our own late at night in the house, basically. Oh, come on which is kind of wild. But then we were sending, we sent the sessions to Ethan Johns, who's a producer and drummer in the, in the UK. And da, da, da. So we ended up still collaborating that way. Um, but it was a really different setup. So we were kind of just on our own and working with 30 Tigers. There's, oh, there's no way in our men. And with our management, they just trust us. And there's no co-writes. There's just me and Steph. So we just created this record on our own that naturally began to move in that direction. Um, and it was probably going out on the road with Marcus and Greta Van Fleet that meant this kind of heavier, rocky element was moving back towards what we'd done. But we genuinely haven't thought about it at all. Just let the song lead and, and let it come out. Because, I mean, really, you're only we're just trying to capture what was in the moment. And this last record, we'd spent, God, goodness knows how many hours on the road. You know, mm. twenty like, probably 200, 250,000 miles that we'd toured since... We, we first hung out in Nashville. I just hadn't stopped. Mm -hmm. So all of that energy was just rolling and it was just, we'd just come off the end of this tour and straight into recording the record. So we didn't really have much of a time to think about it at all. It was just, well, it's going to be what it's going to be, you know? And that's the only way we really know how to work. And I think if we tried to do it any other way, I, I'd, um, I, I would we'd get it wrong, you know? <laughs> something overthink it you know i know it's the overthink I, I cannot work when i'm thinking too hard I, I don't work that way like at all like if i have to be thinking about it, even a count when i'm playing it, it doesn't come off in the same way because i think you're the concept of letting go and just delivering what automatically comes out of your stream of consciousness is probably like expansively deeper than we actually think it is and it's like you're you're actually probably tuning into something that is yeah more understanding than your consciousness is and you're just being a conduit for whatever it is that is speaking through you that's what letting go is i think in some way and so you know to look into your art and your own self enough to be able to 
to be able to turn on that place, like a light switch, like you have by no means, right? Like that's, it could be perceived as a weakness, but it's a strength. Like that's hard to be able to let go and still play guitar and write a song and deliver it. Like that's not easy at all. I, it depends on how you want to deliver your art to people. I mean, there's lots of great ways of making music, man. Like however people want to do it, go for it. But a huge influence on us was working with Ethan Johns, the producer who's, who's a, um, a real advocate of that kind of school of thought, which yeah. is just let, let it happen in the moment and, and let it really be a very honest thing. Because I think so, so often now with technology and the way that we're doing this and making records and, you know, logic and, you know, lunar and Apollo interfaces, like you can tweak to the nth degree and you can <laughs> change in this kind of Lego bricking of making music, you know, when you're playing to a grid and that sort of thing. Um, it's incredibly easy to, you know, I don't know, just create really powerful sonics. Um, but in terms of the records that really, er you know, early records that we all love and that are, are rock and roll classics or whatever, or country classics that, you know, those will cut live in a room with a short amount of budget and they were done quickly. Right. Uh, I, we really feel it's a creative choice to work that way. Yes. And I'm not entirely sure if, I hope our fan base uh, you know, understand that that's what we're doing. A bit like, you know, other great producers, you know, Dave, the Dave Cobbs of this world and people like that that are really um, asserting that this is how we're making records. We're cutting them live, you know, quickly. And this is how we're cutting the vocals and that sort of thing. I think that's, um, it, it's a statement now. And it's not one that many people can make, especially from a major label, because you need tons of mixed tweets you need it to be really really loud it doesn't sound like it's going to be on the radio you know there's, there's a thousand and one boxes you have to tick to be able to de then deliver your music to the person that's going to put it out you know whereas we don't have any of that um and we feel it's a it's a choice you know because you're talking about those early you know early moments and takes and that sort of thing when your stream of consciousness is not going and you're not thinking because yeah. yeah i mean you've made a cracking record and it's like thank you <laughs> in all of those things though it's like some of the moments you i'm sure you remember most about that record is the mistakes you made and the things you couldn't have planned right. that were magic moments you know right. so if you really open yourself up to that and you listen and there's one of the there's one um the moment i remember it, it when we were making the record in this room oh we're talking about vocals right so our first record is completely live and um i think it's if you don't love me which is a song of my hard. favorite song off that <laughs> Well, I'm, my favorite song off that record if i play that song for somebody and they don't like it it's not happening <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm not kidding you like i'm that serious chris like i am i'm not saying that just to blow <laughs> up. i am that serious like i ask people like if they like sad songs and if i play them that song and they don't like it i'm sorry <laughs> it's over. It's over. Well, thank you yeah well for example uh, well talking about that song you know that was all cut live in one or two takes because that's how we were making that first record and we hadn't we had no we hadn't had rehearsals you know, it was <laughs> in the room yeah this is how we were operating at that level and that's what we just did with this live thing. there's no rehearsals it was just dangerous way of making records no, it is dangerous but uh it was like, you know i i fucked up a note i was singing or something or i was questioning like oh man i'm how i sung that line i'm just uh, and you know ethan said right we're having this conversation now hit the space bar everyone turns around in the chair and it's okay well you know you know you're responding to this on a technical level you're hearing the song you're hearing how you're playing you're thinking about where your voice was and you were saying it and um I'm not responding to any of that. I'm purely hearing this on an emotional level. I'm right. hearing you sing the song emotionally and I don't hear anything wrong with that moment. Right, man. And, we, and we also went into it because you said, you know, you could go in and we could drop in this vocal, mm -hmm. but it's, we're then changing the emotional narrative of the entire take. Right, right. By changing that moment in time, you're literally going back in, you're changing that moment. And it's, that's a big conversation because he saw it as, you know, diminishing returns. Okay, so we fixed that mistake or that moment you're not sure of, but how does that, the impact on the rest of the vocal and the rest of the musical narrative, yes. it's a big deal. It's a huge deal, I think, you know. Huge deal. Yeah, so that's how I think about it. Anyway, and that's why even on the new record, we were on our own 
playing live in you know the living room but we still work deep deep river which you've heard which is out on spotify now with marcus big full band production but that was recorded live in the living room me and an acoustic guitar and then everything else was added afterwards well that's nasty sir that's it's weird right <laughs> that's insane would you cut it to a click though no yeah really naughty yeah Freaking dirty, man. <laughs> love is dirty love is naughty right? this you is shouldn't do that right i think you should like everything that shouldn't happen is happening so it's like music definitely gonna be a reflection of such a thing that is unbelievable and that brings up a really good point which is we're presently doing a record right now but going back to the other record young man's country it was that it was sitting down in the studio and setting the parameters prior to entering Pandora's box. Cause you know, when you get into Pandora's box and if you have the freedom to hit the space bar a thousand times before lunch, you're going to, and it's like, don't let your ego uh, convince you that you're right. So quick, like don't, a mistake is not a mistake. A mistake is a perception before it's defined as a mistake. It's just simply a noticing. That's all you're doing. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's yeah. like, it's funny how time converts mistakes into assets. It's really real. Cause like go back and listen to the record now. And the first song off our record is the first take of the first day. <laughs> and it was like, we, there was such an energy there that we weren't yet able to define in words that now that the record's been out for, um, you know, seven months or so, we can see now it was like that energy now is very apparent on the song. But at the time, it was just kind of like this nervous anxiety of wanting to get things going. We thought, oh, are we rushing this? Should we cut it again? Oh, maybe that verse lyric wasn't the best delivered there. I, mean, I went to the fifth one. I should have gone to the third. Right. Things like that. And I realized like in time, like time turns those mistakes into character and assets and moments that you don't have the power to recreate consciously. No, no. And even if, yeah, yeah consciously, if you, as soon as you think about it, the, the, the jig is up, man. <laughs> the jig is up. It's done, you know? You know and I, I think there's a lot of that, even in songwriting. I think in every step of the creative process, that's a really important thing. I think there's a Dylan quote, which is like, as soon as you realize you're writing a song, it's over, you know, because that stream of consciousness thing, you've got to not, it's almost like meditation, you know, you've got to not think about what you're doing almost to really free, uh, free yourself to do it. But especially in record making, I think right now we, you know, you've, I mean, it's endless the ways you can make music and making that choice to it. And also even to get a band like, you know, you and your guys can actually cut live. I mean, you're in Nashville. People play live in Nashville. There's great players everywhere. But I'm telling you, in the rest of the world, you know, a lot of the, you know, kind of London and places where, you know. No show. And, I mean, the idea of cutting a live band record is quite a rare thing now. Um, and there's not many artists that will do it, especially like kind of live vocal takes and that sort of thing, or you know, even live playing and, you know, solos and, you know, that sort of thing. It's, Why do you think that is? Is there just not a demand for it within that specific region market-wise? Or is it just like, like, why do you think that that is? <laughs> I think uh, it's, yeah. I mean, the, the UK right now isn't, isn't so band focused. It's much more focused on singer songwriters and the pop star thing and the, the indie producers in their bedroom. Um, mm. But also I think it's just risk. It is risky. If you get an A&R man to sign a five piece rock and roll band and oh. you, you have to spend 40 to a hundred thousand pounds getting them in a proper studio with a big name producer and they have four weeks to make something that's either going to be a huge success or not, not. You know, how many bedroom producers could you sign for the same amount you know that could top various playlists on spotify or what have you it's a completely different uh it just it doesn't make any business sense so i think that's the other reason you're seeing less of it mm -hmm. um because it's just a huge risk. That's why I feel it's a creative choice with certain producers to work that way. Mm. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I feel it's different talking to someone from Nashville that plays live all the time, man, because it's just, that's what you do is your remit, you know, <laughs> but outside of that, that sort of, um, you know, that's part of the reason we've loved playing uh, in America so much and traveling as much as we have is because there's a real focus and enjoyment and love of live guitar music. It's yeah. just, part of the you know the it's just in in your blood out there you know it really is isn't it it's crazy it's crazy it 
use the, the term genre Americana because I feel like Americana means so many things. Everything, right? I mean, this is the beauty of American music is it is just all of music is love and there's so much influence and culture that moved to America and is expressed through the music in such a uh, incredible, you know, incredible way. You know, What do you think is... <sighs> I want to come out on the other side of COVID like more evolved. You know, of course you're going to have new music, you're going to have new perceptions, but have you felt any kind of evolution uh, in regards to your creative process and in regards to how you just view yourself as a performer, as an artist and in realizing yourself as a musician, you know, cause it, at least here in the United States, like we're, we're, there's talks on this quote unquote COVID is over, which I don't even know what that means, but I think, you know, cause it probably means many things. Um, it's obviously not that way in the UK right now, right? Cause you guys are still in lockdown. Yeah. But our numbers are very, very low. I will say that I, I do feel sometimes cause we were in the U S for the beginning of the pandemic. We only came back a few months ago and we'll probably be back out in the States, you know, when things open up again, oh, good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're yeah. very on top of the statistics here and sharing that information. But yeah. I know they're not. They not the same way in the US sometimes, you know. <laughs> oh, no, no, not at all. There's a really odd perception, it's, especially here in Nashville. They were just not giving a fuck. <laughs> no one was saying anything about it. Yeah. I'll tell you, dude, we were downtown. We've been playing gigs downtown for months, like since July. That blows my mind. That blows my mind that you've been playing shows. I mean, but you got to do what you got to do, man. I get it, you know. But like compared to here, where we've all been locked down, you know, it's crazy. I think it's cool that <clears throat> I do appreciate the option that if you want to subject yourself to the danger, you have the ability to. And although, you know, of course, who else are you going to be hurting if you if you if you go out and say you do get COVID, you know? But the way that it just panned out in Nashville was they, they pretty early on allowed for the opportunity to live music to come back at very limited capacities. But here we are in 2021 now and dude, it is crazy. They have these signs that, you know, um, that the, 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 the local, um, you know, Metro Nashville comes and puts up into these honky tonks where it's like, don't, don't, don't dance. Uh, if you're going to stand up, you have to wear a mask, right? But if you're sitting down, you have to wear a mask, right? If you're going to leave the, your table, you have to wear a mask. But if you're at your table, you don't have to wear a mask, like all these things that don't quite make sense, but they're kind of like, just how do you do the right dance socially, you know, to, to, to make sure that COVID is the safest it could be. Mm -hmm. But where we're at here now is like, <laughs> they're, they're taking these signs. We were playing on Friday and these dudes are dancing with their wives, like wearing Harley Davidson sweatshirts and shit. And they no masks on and they just go and they take the signs and just flip them around <laughs> to where you can't see them anymore. And it's like, man, like people are very much so, why I'm saying that is that people are kind of done with it. Like they're, they're ready to go on and experience the next chapter of their lives. Right. And whether like, that's the medium that you're expressing that I don't, I would rather do it in a more gracious way by being like, well, let's go play some shows and, and put out some new music as opposed to like tear down signs that are saying to not promote COVID safety. But it's like, I've noticed within myself on like the evolution of, of wanting to come out of COVID, like I have a much more mindful approach of who I am now. And um, le reacting less and less to just like this um, intuitive, like you mentioned it earlier, like wanting to hit space bar and delete things, just like more accepting of myself and um, just more, more mature, having more, having had more life experience. And so is this new record, although you did cut it in the midst of COVID, is it symbolic of that kind of an evolution on a personal and, and team-based growth? I think it was part of it, definitely, especially with self-producing a record and having time to do it ourselves and making that decision to do it, but also set in a way being forced because we couldn't make the record any other way. You know, we had to operate. We had to record it like that. We had to do it now because being an independent artist, you know, outgoings, bills to pay, it's like you can't, you've got to keep producing. And we, we decided that, you know, we couldn't wait. We called it quite early with the pandemic and said, we're not going to be playing shows for at least a year. Oh, we yeah. just decided we kind of made that decision and we felt quite confident in it. So that's why we kind of committed to that. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of yeah, the, the, the growth as a musician in, in producing the record was a, was a big thing. Um, but it, more the record itself, it was an interesting moment to record it 
because the record was influenced by tens of thousands of miles traveled on the road. And it was all written about that experience traveling across America, 43 states, whatever, and everything we've seen and going back and forth to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a celebration of all of that. But there's a, there's a feeling on that record, which I, we haven't quite... I can't quite put into words yet. No one else has heard it. I know you've, you've heard it, but I've heard it. <laughs> there's a, there's a, the first song on the album is called Road to Avalon. And there's a feeling on that track, which is really bizarre because it's kind of hopeful. It's kind of heartbroken, right. but it's very expansive for me. I can, it, it's the combination of things that we piece together, but the way we sang it, I think you can hear that sense of um, longing and, you know, um, you know, of, of and for what we might have lost you know being on the road and having experienced all of that and all of a sudden to being in this cocoon and completely shut down in those early weeks in Nashville uh, and off the road and the, the uncertainty hanging over all of us was a really uh, big feeling so we didn't think too much about it at the time we were just like kind of do or die get this down now right so I, you can hear that on the record um, but then after that in terms of personal growth I think um coming home and I think it makes it's made a lot of people question you know how close you know family and friends and just all the simple important things in life and being close to people you love and and what's really important I think that's made us think about that because you know we've been running on fumes for the last <laughs> two and a half years <laughs> so you know to actually sit and relax and breathe and, and have some routine as you know as a musician on the road routine is something you don't get so having you know, regular meal times and sleeping and, you know, that sort of thing was incredibly healthy and realizing as well, you know, that, our, that, that those years had taken a toll physically, you know, and being able to actually sleep and, you know, like feel, you know, the best version of yourself. I think that, that kind of mindfulness, I, you know, I, I agree that we've definitely gotten back to some of the simple things in that respect across this period. Musically, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I've, I've I've listened to a lot more music and I've been writing music a lot more, but um, oh, I don't know how it's going to change the next record. I don't know yet. Yeah. We're not there yet, so we'll see. <laughs> That's good that you felt inspired to write. You know, I, <clears throat> several several people, uh, even guests on this podcast, did not write many songs in 2020. Yeah. Well, that's why I think we were really lucky that we'd written the record on the road the pandemic happened and then we had all these songs to record because right. I agree trying to write songs across that period otherwise would have been incredibly difficult. And I've begun to now there's more coming out, but we were lucky that we just had, we had the material there because I can understand how that, that uncertainty um, the impending sense of doom or, you know, it's not going to put you in a creative frame of mind. Is it necessarily, you know, it's weird that impending sense of doom is I feel like I've always had that in my whole life. Like I, I'm, I was, I had this crazy dream the other day that was like, my psyche was definitely speaking to me and um, like just projecting uncertainty and doubt and fears um, in the forms of imagery of dreams. And it was like, um, it was really heavy. And I came out of this dream, just like shocked, you know, just sweating bullets and I, I realized, like, I don't ever remember not having, like, a sense of, like, uncertainty or, you know, and that's the thing is, like, I don't know if COVID started that in my life, but it definitely uh, inflamed it more. It made it more of an inflamed feeling. And so, like, when I hear about people becoming more Zen and stuff in COVID, I'm very interested to hear about, like, how did you, like, w did you have a routine that you stuck to every day? Was it, was it no. like practice i'm gonna write i'm gonna sleep this many hours nah man i mean we are yeah we've been uh, we moved our lives around a lot so we we you know have come back and have been moving around and we're moving to another part of the uk and we you know shipped some stuff back from the us so we were just everything was all over the place but i just get i guess routine of just waking up in the same bed uh, that's about as routine as i can get but uh i, I think everything you just said <laughs> we're in black on almost all occasions possible yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's <Continue>. unchanged. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think um, what, what you just said speaks to just being a self-employed musician in, you know, 2020, 2021, man. Like this is a wild time to be trying to make a living out of, out of music. 
Uh, and I've always said it's a miracle, you know, making money at a music full stop, but let alone a living, you know. Um, so I think that level of uncertainty always kind of chases musicians, especially people bold enough to, you know, write and perform their own material. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge ask that we're asking people to um, uh, invest in art and ideas <laughs> and then think, you know it's a very rare situation to be in so i think that's always kind of chasing you as a musician it must be right it's such a crazy thing you don't even realize how crazy it is until you're actually trying it for for a year or two yes and then you yes. realize that man this water is deep <laughs> <laughs> yeah i didn't know how deep then it was start, then you start signing contracts and people start working with you and you know then they have ideas and the whole thing is just yeah it's a very um yeah it's a wild way to make a living so i think uh it's a choice it's especially a choice. you man like um you're doing it with your partner that is what <laughs> like you're talking about an intense goal that is insane yeah people always think yeah like how how could you work together like that but We've known each, other, known each other a long time. We went together when we first met and then it yep. just kind of became kind of inevitable. Mm. Uh, but to be honest, we have never thought about it. We've never really thought about it. It's just happened. Again, not thinking about it. Just, it's just happened, you know, and we never, you know, uh, mm. there's a lot of musicians that are incredibly driven and focused on, okay, I'm going to be here doing this. This is one by this year, you know, five-year plans as much as you can. And we've never really done any of that. We've just focused on what's in front of us and concentrated on the music. And we're very lucky that we're um, 99.5% of the time on the same page in terms of creatively thinking and musically thinking and even aesthetically putting records together. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm relatively outgoing and yeah. um, uh, we'll, we'll go on like the stranger things and we'll kind of push the wilder ideas that come into our lives as you know you get offered shows and things happen and i'm probably the person that will say yes to to you know new adventure and in business and that sort of thing whereas um you know steph is the wild middle child but she's very stable so we kind of <laughs> complement each other in that respect and we just got really really lucky really lucky that is that it worked. yin and yang a real so like i've been very interested in the concepts of yin and yang i've been doing almost over no over 200 guitar lessons this year that are one hour a piece like a lot of them and the thing that i've been learning is that yin and yang exists in music and then i'm realizing that of course it exists in almost everything in life um how have you noticed that like that's the thing i've noticed in relationships is it's the proper uh conduction of yin and yang that actually like inhibits like a a team, like, because you guys are a musical team that's like bulletproof strong. Like anyone who hasn't seen your shows, you guys are participating on the same wavelength. Although it's two separate beings, it's definitely one effort. That's two brains and hearts are powering. And it's wild, man. And there's an insane yin and yang energy there that is timelessly old that you guys are tapping into. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It's a wild thing to see. It's strange. No, I, th I think it's just doing to some extent. I think we've just, um, right. I, I feel, um, especially when it comes to recording and playing, that uh, if you do it enough, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what I'm about to say. Let's see what, see what comes out. <laughs> but thinking about, uh, think about music and performance um, in general, as I, you know, uh, there's always going to be someone especially in the arts, it's, it's all opinion and it's nothing's based really in kind of fact. And you, you're, never gonna, you're never going to be the best, uh, you know, I'm never going to be the best Telecaster player, you know, with, especially with you. Neither am I. You know what I mean? I'm never going to be the best guitar player. I'm never going to be the best singer. I'm never going to be Dylan, you know, so you, you kind of accept that. And I think especially live, we just got to a point where we were playing so much that it kind of feels like meditation when you're really in, in a moment and you're really singing, um, you kind of zone out. And that's when I think we're, we're, we're at our best, whether you like what we do or we're not, because we're just um, in tandem, you know, in tandem singing, you know, and just singing music, really. Uh, my mum runs a community choir and, you know, uh, I think singing is, you know, it's just the arts is incredibly important. So we don't, I, I don't know, I don't know what I'm saying here. When it comes to that yin and yang thing. Wow. Um, I think it's just doing it, you know, it's, um, 
it's doing it is is just the more you do it the easier it becomes and we've never really concentrated or thought about thought about it too much and we try not to steph always says we try not to <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy i think the the act of just simply doing is is um <clears throat> what you're what you're saying there is you're you're acknowledging the fact that there's resistance to do simply anything and you're just going to go ahead and persist through it anyway right there's resistance to go and record this record right you guys were in san antonio and which is literally probably geographically or culturally the most opposite place on how COVID has been being handled than, than, than London and the UK in general, like yes. there not be a more opposite place, no. um, which is so ironic and funny, but you guys took that resistance and you said, fuck it. I'm just going to do it anyway. That's insane, man. It's very brave, very powerful. You guys are very powerful people and it, it reflects in your music. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think, well, we just dedicated ourselves to what we do, you know? And I think, um, Right. I've just kind of given up, you know, given up caring about. Um, wow, sir. Given up caring about the music industry side of things and the money side of things or uh, what we should be doing and where we should be going and what people think we should be playing. I think we really just cared about what we thought about it. Um, and that's just, I think, became the focus of it because that's when, you know, true art or at least honest art is, is really made. Um, it's when you stop caring about, you know, what people think and you just make something you go with your gut, you know. Anyway, something like that. Yeah, no, don't be sorry. That's the beautiful thing. Like, Because when you're performing on stage and you're in that flow, you know, that's what all you're doing is you're going from your gut, whatever those words mean. You know what I mean? Like you're literally just, you're just going like whatever, whatever comes your way. It's the weird thing is why are some successful and why are some not? Like you guys are successful. Marcus King is successful. Like Greta Van Fleet successful. All these acts that you've toured with. And Obviously, there's no answer to this. It's all opinion based. But that's something I think about all the time. It's like, why are why is talent actually not the main variable? It's not the main litmus that really determines success. And so in your yeah. just philosophizing on it, what do you think it is? Here's what I think it is. In circling back to vibrations, I think it's your job as a musician which means a million and one fucking things to, to different identities who participate in the music industry. Um, it means you have to find out what you do and hone in on that vibration really well and just be able to churn it out like an FM radio station, right? Mm. And the people who mm. like that station are going to come and the people who don't like that station are going to go to the millions of other stations that there are that are just as important and valuable as you are. Just right? as valid. Yeah. just as valid mm -hmm. just as valid right no yeah. Yeah, right some might have higher gross margins right some might have less some might have a higher fan base some might have less right but it's just as valid and so i think that whole thing of success is finding where you are on a vibrational level and just putting that out into the world and then people come i think you're completely right and that's i think yeah it took me years to get to a uh right to, to think in those terms because um if you try to be other people you try to emulate other identities that are doing what you think you want to be doing when really yeah yeah so yeah. i mean but also which working with industry they they that people have ideas of what you should be and how it should sound and what it should be like but in, in actual fact i think it's uh yeah like you say talent isn't isn't the most important thing that's why i said when we gave up caring you know about well i'm never going to be the best at this and um, it was on some of those, uh, we did some shows with Greta, Greta and, um, Greta Van Fleet. Great. Band. Yeah. It was like, you know, 12, 12 and a half thousand people. Some of the shows that like big shows, big, bigger shows I've ever played. And they, you know, we, they just kind of picked us up out of obscurity at the time. Cause we were just in the U S and, um, a lot of evil. I like what we did. And we went on, went on that tour, um, the three, there's three of us. There's me and Steph and a driver. There's, there was no guitar techs, no sound guys, no nothing. Why not though? Are you guys not getting enough money just to bring on a tech? We just didn't need to. We just <laughs> we didn't need to. We were like, we'll do this ourselves, you know? So, <laughs> we, like a hundred bucks. You yeah, know, we were like, you know, the monitor guy. Yeah, we'll have the monitor guy do our monitors. But other than that, we'll just run with it because. Why not? Um, you know, it's like if I snap a string, I'll play my other guitar. Oh, I mean, that's what I'm serious. <laughs> you know, you that's savages, dude. You guys are and that's, evil. And also because we just made it up as we went along, uh, 
you know, just improvising, you know, like if you change, if you change and you move and you shift, really exciting things happen. And I think we realized when doing that, that the audience realized that we were doing that, that we were just making it up on the spot and that there was just two of us. And, and then that, that, that was a really emotionally big moment, you know, for people to realize that we were doing that and they were there with us and they realized how big a moment this was for us and, and what was going on and how exciting that was. Uh, and that talking about tuning into that FM radio and we found, you know, like, you know, we were creating our own world on these albums. That's what we're trying to do. Yes, you do. You know, you invest in it or you don't. You get it or you don't. And that's cool, you know. But if you, it's a bit like those great, you know, I've been going wild into Fairport Convention and Richard Thompson at the moment, you know. Other story. But when you go into that, a world like the Grateful Dead or something, when you're in that world, it's like, wow, I get it. Something is exciting here. And that's what I think really you have to try and, uh, create and focus on in your music because any other way isn't going to work. You know, if you start making compromises for other people or start making the music that other people think you should make, you're not going to be proud of it. It's not going to stand the test of time. You're not going to believe in it, you know, uh, and you start making compromises and you end up somewhere wholly unnatural, I think. So I don't know. I don't know where we started with that question, but that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> The podcast is, it's so fun. It's such a good, you're, cause you're, you realize that your consciousness is the same thing as an instrument where you are using mediums of tones that are coming out in words, not notes that you're creating a statement with and you're just improvising. Mm. It's like the same freaking thing. It's like, instead of, instead of a fretboard, it's my consciousness. Yeah. This is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Hiding behind a guitar is one thing, but actually speaking, you know, on these subjects is is, is much more difficult. You know, you do a fantastic job at it. <laughs> there is a, um, I think you know, making compromises with people that prove to be worthy of making compromises for is something that has to asterisk because, like, I've had a lot of interactions with people in the industry that are really valuable that are on my team now that I make compromises for, you know, especially right now, like maybe let's not post this until we announce a show, right? Like maybe, you know, tone down on this or like, why don't we actually drive here when we, when we go and, and we, when we uh, route this date and do all these things. And do you really need that fade out on that, on that, on that track? Or should we just go ahead and do like a drum fill and close it out? Like good compromises. I call it negotiating with reality where there's like a low resolution reality in your mind. And then there's the, the most high resolution reality is the one we can touch and interact with. And there's going to be some shit that is lost and, and changed along the way from mind to reality. And you need people that help you along that process. But the thing that is weird about the music industry is people mm. reach out to you and they can say they have all these badges of honor and they can say that they can help you, but they have yet to really prove that. And they can kind of fuck with your identity a little bit there. And you can start thinking that you're not enough. And so it sounds like what you've done in a very strategic way, which is very admirable, is you've brought people onto the team of Item A that understand the potential of what Item A is already and what they will be. And those are the people that you're negotiating, compromising with. Yeah, uh, we've been incredibly fortunate. And I know everyone has horror stories in the music industry and people- you, you got to have them. Ways to, I mean, it's, I mean, they're, you know, battle it's scarred, man. It's all part of it, these stories, you know. Everyone has them. Um, Why wouldn't they? Of course you should. Like it's a big price to pay to be it's yeah. a music. Like you're gonna have to deal with some some people that make you feel weird. <laughs> Not like yeah. enough. it's like it's part of it. We're incredibly lucky to have amazing uh, management that are good friends and we're incredibly close with. You know, uh, I trust them in any scenario and situation. But it's partly because um, I guess in terms of compromise, I mean more on the the art the art side of things. So making a record. Mm -hmm. uh, we needed a, we, we, you know, we've, there are moments you need a producer. You need someone to steer the ship, to help make the creative decisions, to go, look. Yeah, man. Full of ideas, especially when you're younger as well. I said, like, there's so many ideas here. This is what's important right now. This is the focus for this album. This is what we're going to try and do. It's operational uh, skills, which young people often, even in business, don't have. Yeah. Yet. Young people are always in charge of operations. It's, you got to have operational understanding and experience. And that's what a producer brings to the table. So everyone who's trying to like self-produce and just say, I don't need a producer, be very careful before you go ahead and say, you want to just wipe out a social convention that easily when you don't even understand yeah. the value. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've worked with 
ton of producers over the years. We, we oh, yeah. counted up about 10 different producers in our different rock and roll bands outfits. Holy shit. Different sizes. So we've, we were in a, we're in a, a good position to go, you know what, we're going to do ourselves this time because if right. we can't do it by now, what have we been doing this whole time? You know what I mean? Like, what have we been doing? Yeah. But when it comes to the smaller uh, minutiae of, of, of getting an act on the road and making compromises there, you have to because, you know, uh, your, your team and the people around you and the label, the people distributing your music, you know, they, they've got to turn a buck and this is what they do. And they have your best interests at heart. But in terms of when it comes to me- kind of rec- making a record, um, the artist is the only person that has to live with it you know they're the only person you know anyone in your management team or label or publisher that says you should definitely do this well you, you don't have to live with the decision in you know 10 years time you have to listen to it you have to play it every night you know so in that respect that's the type the stuff you have to think about a little more you know <laughs> easy yeah man. it's really wild it's really it's a again going back to the concept it's a big ask that you're asking for out of life and of yourself to be able to go and make music and do that in a way that the market and society says is valuable. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, going back to that point. Yeah. I mean, even having people around you that think that you're capable of that is a huge blessing, you know, trust, trust in your um, ideas. You know, we're very lucky that, I mean, when we first decided to go more independent, we said, we want we don't want to sign to a label we don't want to sign a publishing deal right now we just we want to do it on our own and go and see how far that takes us and they went yeah let's try it which is kind of you know you know isn't that's not a normal thing (laughs) for necessarily for necessarily management to do because you know uh, you sign deals you get advances that's money in the bank you know so it was a not really yeah well it it was a it's a bold step for people to think like that but in terms of what is there's a great book by a Polish author. Wow. I always forget the name of. It's called the book is called Creativity, and he wrote a book called Flow as well. Okay, so it's like a neuro. It's a neuroscience book. Um, it kind of um, I can't remember his name. Yeah, the book's called Creativity, and uh, I've, I've I've read it quite early on. Um, but basically, it studies creativity in in, in different areas. From it talks about creative thinking in business. Uh, in, in science uh, and in the arts and in teaching. And that was a really valuable book for me because it discusses just what you're saying, which is why do some things uh, are accepted in culture? And they, at the time, I think the author calls them memes of culture before me. This was before memes were memes as we know them now, right. you know, you know, discussing what, what, how do some things become accepted? Why do they become accepted? How, uh, and, and what dictates that? And it's looking into that really. And it's all about, you know, how much you bend what is already traditional and yes. you know, like tradition versus what is fresh and what is new and, and how far you can bend it. If you go too far, it's too avant-garde. Right. But it might be like Van Gogh. And then years later, your work is regarded as, you know, genius. Like a lot of the early country blues artists that I adore, you know, in their day, they weren't respected or heard of. And then later on, you know, or known at least they were respected amongst their peers, I'm sure, but they weren't, you know, known, accepted uh, memes in, in, in popular society and culture. I don't know. It's fascinating. And I wish I knew the answer, but I think uh, becoming that kind of um, chimera of a moment and uh, uh, yeah. is for a lot of people, it's, it's luck, right person, right place, right time. Sure. You know, sometimes it's luck and sometimes it, I, don't, I think it's very hard to engineer. But I think the, su- the success story is where you go from zero to hero. You know, we formed a band and then we became a massive, you know, famous. Uh, yeah. So rare. So rare. So, so rare. And what's wrong is you, you'll you see that into the world. What's not wrong, but what's worth thinking about is you'll see that. You'll see it on social media. You'll see the content of it and you think, well, I need to do that. And then you place this expectation on yourself that wasn't present in your initial um, founding of your relationship with music. So now you're incorporating this new desire into the chain link that you're placing a great bit of importance on and no one's put it there except you. But if you don't fulfill it, which you don't even understand how the, the person fulfilled it or how the team fulfilled it, but you're placing all this expectation on yourself to go out there and fulfill it. And if you don't, you're fucked. And that's like you telling yourself that. And it's weird now how we have this carrot of opportunities always dangling in front of us that we're comparing ourselves to when really 
What's so beautiful is that you should just look inside and find out what the highest, purest vibration of yourself is, and then try to put that out into the world and then see who likes it and market it in that way, which is what you guys are doing. But it took some experience and trials and error for you guys to kind of arrive at that, it seems. Yeah, I, I think ultimately that's the only way people that have real longevity and stamina in music like, is the only what? way you can really do that because otherwise you're going to burn out or hate what you've done or, you know. You don't and, think about being you. Y- you know, yeah, exactly. You know, that vibration thing, you know. I, I think it's true. I, I, I think that's how, kind of how it has to be. And uh, I often try and draw parallels with other with other art forms, you know, because I think we forget that um, so often, and especially, in, you know, painting. There was a great series, I don't know if you can get it in the US, on the BBC called uh, What Do Artists Do All Day? Oh, Man. Oh. If you can dig it out, it's a fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. They go, they find, um, you know, beautiful portrait painters or landscape painters, mainly painters, you know. Um, and it was like, what the hell do you do all day? Like, how do you operate? How do you make money? Like, what's your process? Because it's so incredibly private. It's which, arguably, I'd say it's just as private uh, in making and producing music, or at least in writing music. But your art as an artist because you become the mouthpiece of your art, which is very, you know, very, very different and has implications. And I think, you know, people forget that, you know, you're playing a character and there's acting involved in, um, in making music and that sort of thing, persona. But um, when it comes to, uh, you know, canvas painting, you're, it's incredibly private. You know, you're there on your own. No one ever sees you do it. You don't have to say anything about it. Same with photography. You know, you're, it's just you behind a camera and you're the choices you make with the button, you know. So I, I find it fascinating diving into photographers and how they work. And anyway, this um, mm-hmm. BBC program is fascinating because it was like, you know, you all of a sudden you're in the middle of nowhere in North Wales and you're in someone's barn and they're an incredible painter mm-hmm. and they're on their own and they're mm-hmm. staring at this canvas and they're just staring at it for 10 minutes Jesus. You know, and not, nothing's being said. And, the, and you know, they just go at the end of it, you know, Oh shit, you know, walk out, you know, and you're like, I love this idea of you. everyone has, this, every artist has this creative compass that they're, they're really focused on this set of ideals and principles, creative and artistic principles that we're driven by innately for whatever reason, what we've listened to, uh, what we care about, uh, our experiences in life. And that's just, we have these ideas of what is good and bad. And that's what we're driven by. And I think it's really important to, to look into other art forms and to consider how they operate. Um, yes, sir. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, there's something that I'm completely fascinated by and I'm yes, trying sir. to learn more and more about anyway. It's just how uh, those people think about what they do. Because especially because art uh, and, and business clash so painfully in the music industry. Yeah, when, when I'm sure they do in all art forms. I'm sure they do in all art forms, but particularly music, it feels very, you know, you know, t- ticket sales, ticket prices, numbers, algorithms. You know, yep. uh, it's, I'm sure it's the same in photography now, but in the earlier it's days of worse in photography, because the, how do you how do you really capture your ip when you have literal social platforms that have billions of users that destroy it on a on a secondly basis yeah i know yeah. it's wild as well so i if you can watch that program and anyone else out there what do artists do all day it's a really fascinating watch and uh, i've tried to find it again a couple of times after it was on the telly box and i can't find it now but it's out there somewhere i'm sure <laughs> unbelievable i will check it out uh, dude, I just want to say one thing about Ida Mays, wh- why I think it, I was thinking a lot about it. Why is it so, like, why is it so real? And, <laughs> like, and so I think why it's real is because in life, you essentially have, like, everything pays a cost of existence. And I think the basic cost of entry to exist on this earth is yin and yang, right? Order and then some chaos. And I think we see that manifest in every form of art. You see it manifest in the hero's journey, like on Pinocchio, like on Lion King, like Hercules, right? You start at a nice place where there's order, you go into chaos, and then you come out the other side with order, right? And there's always a partner. 
there's always somebody who goes in there with the hero as well that comes down the other side together as a partnership. And I think you guys, in a modern sense of what Americana music is and what you guys are putting out, perfectly encapsulate the energy of yin and yang. And you're tapping into that thing that is just thousands and thousands of years old, the energy of chaos and order. And it's alive in front of you when you're witnessing it. And you guys are just one energy together uh, doing that thing just perfect energy of yin and yang encapsulated into two finely dressed people. <laughs> it's unbelievable. That's incredibly generous. In, in some sense, you guys are kind of like kind of the perfect meme. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's incredibly generous. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, and I think it just comes down to, I think, you know, I, if anyone else can hear that, I'm, I'm incredibly glad, but that's what you've just said is what we've tried to, to capture. And so much of that is in the process, you know, um, so much of that is in the process because we could have very easily cleaned up what we do and, and co-written uh, a lot of kind of super huge love ballads and auto-tuned our voices and compressed everything to death and, you know, done that route, but we didn't, sorry, route, as they say, as I've, as I've got used to saying in America. <laughs> but yeah, we just kept it warts and all and kept it honest and, and do or die mentality, like we said, just trying to get into that vibration. And then just you just hope that, Hey, well, man, I'm playing in this bar and there is 12 people here and they're really, really listening. And man, that last song made that person weep a little bit. You know, that was a sad song. Like if, if these people are feeling this, you just got to have faith that when more people hear about it, they'll, that they'll, the numbers of people that love it will increase. And that's about as much as you can do. Sure. It really is, man. Absolutely. I, I'm the biggest fan. I thank you for your time, Chris. I, I'll let you get back to you. Um, uh, capturing that live stream i can't wait to watch <laughs> yeah well absolute pleasure man yeah thank you so much i'm a huge fan man and i hope we get to hang out soon in in, uh, in, in nashville again once this uh nonsense is all over yeah yeah let me know when you're here it'll be fun yeah absolutely man thank you my friend i'll talk to you later dude have a good have one pleasure you too man see you later <laughs> Chris Turpin of Ida May, y'all go check out the new record. Check them out on YouTube. Check them out on Spotify. Any place that you go and listen to music, consume content. Uh, their Instagrams are also very fun as well. Um, love this band. I would go and see them literally anywhere. I've seen them play many times, and each time I am reaffirmed of how much uh, I'm affected by them and, and love what they do, so I cannot recommend them enough. Um, Cosmic Country and Western songs out everywhere in the cosmos. Go and check out that album. It works for every scene in your daily life. It keeps you cosmic and it keeps you staying patient, persistent, and positive. Thank you to my friends here at the Lost Highway Podcast at Osiris Media for hosting the podcast and our friends over at Topo Chico for keeping us hydrated. Um, remember, y'all, don't try. Between thought and expression lies a lifetime. I'll see y'all down the road. Osiris.